Uh, we've been uh, in, in Ephesians uh, for a little while now, and we finally have moved out of uh, the section where Paul is laying out a lot of doctrine for us. Who, who you are, your identity in Christ Jesus. Right? We've, so we've said that Ephesians is about who you are, your identity. And Paul is going to shift, not because he doesn't have any, any ethical imperatives or anything that imperative that in the first three chapters, but he's, he was laying the foundation for the things he's about to say uh, to us to do as Christians. This message is really for people who have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So if you're in here and you're like searching out, like, I, what is it to be a Christian? What is that like? This message can be for you too. But I'm primarily speaking to the, to the body of, of believers, the people that are gathered here today that have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. This is a, a particular message that is, that is for you. And, uh, but I'm not trying to leave you out. If you're, not, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and any time during this message you're like, I want to be saved, you call out on the name of the Lord, and the Bible says you are saved. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says that you've become part of the family, and this message can be yours at any time you hear the Holy Spirit with that. But the imperatives of who you are in Christ Jesus, so get back on my, on my track, right? That you've been, if you're just reading through the, the first couple of chapters, you've been, you've been elected, you've been chosen to be part of the family of God, you've been adopted to be part of the family of God. In, in Christ Jesus, you have been uh, redeemed, you have been forgiven, you have become Right? You've become a child uh, of God, and you can grow in the knowledge of, of Him. Right? God has taken you uh, from death, and He's made you into life. He's prepared good works for you to walk in. These are, these are commands, things that you're having to do. Uh, for he has said that, that he, has, um, he has blessed you with all the spiritual blessings. Like This is your identity, who you are right now in Christ Jesus. And in response to that, Paul is going to say, because this is who you are, you're going to have to live your life in a way that, that, is, uh, that matches what you believe. Right? Because how you believe about God, what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about yourself in Christ, is going to determine, who, determine what you think, what you say, and what you do. And I've said time and time again, your behavior determines your paternity. Your behavior determines your paternity. Jesus says it's not what goes in that makes a man unclean, but what comes out. All right? So whatever comes out of your mouth, the things that come out of your heart, the things that come out of the way you live your life, shows just how much faith you have maybe in Christ, what Jesus has done for you, and what you believe about God. Well, that's why this is so essential. But it's really important because he begins, he begins this whole section with therefore. All right, so that's why I'm kind of setting this up. You have, to, you have to fully understand those first three chapters because that doctrine is going to help prevent you from becoming a legalist. Because he's about to rattle off imperative after imperative after imperative. And if you're like, I'm not an English major, Matthew, you just tell me what plainly is an imperative. It's a command. You're supposed to do it. And there's different ways. In the Greek, uh, you can spell a word differently. In English, it doesn't work out as much. But if you're in a different foreign language, typically, uh, how you spell a word will tell you how impactful that word is supposed to be. Right? In English, we just spell it the same way, and we're lazy, so we have a punctuation for commands, an exclamation point. Right? Stop, exclamation point, is a little bit stronger than just stop with a period, although both are commands. But in Greek, they spell it differently, so you can kind of tell. Now, Paul is going to start out really nice here at the beginning of chapter 4, and then he starts laying down imperatives. And so if you're, if you're just a, here for holiness points, and you're going to be like, okay, uh, there's 58 commands. I don't know if there's 58. I haven't counted them yet. Let's just say there are 58 because there's a lot. Uh, and you're like, okay, I do 56 of those. I'm pretty good. If you're saying that to yourself when we get there, then you've missed the point of what Paul is trying to tell you. Okay, because James, in the book of James, James says, if you fail to meet one command, you've broken them all. All right, so I also, but I also don't want you to wind up in despair because you're like, I'm not doing these things yet. And that's why Paul is urging you to do them. Now, he's very strongly urging you to do these particular things, but, but he's laying out these are, these are commands, and because God has, is saying it to us, then we need to fully embrace them and do them, not to get God's favor, but because of what God has already done for us. If I am truly alive because of what Jesus Christ has done, then it should not be too much of a difficulty to begin to live the life in a way that reflects that transformation that has happened. 
if you meet Christ Jesus, you cannot be the same person. If you've fallen at his feet and made him the Lord of your life, you, you cannot be the same person shortly after that. Because the Bible says he's given you a new heart, a new mind, a new family to belong to. Right? If you've been adopted into God's family, and you want to start to honor God because he's your father, you start doing what, he, what his rules are. Because God is a good God. And he loves you. And because of that, now he's empowering you to live this life. So this is not just like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and I start laying these things down. This is God breathing life into you and empowering you to carry out these imperatives. You're not alone. Besides, he's given you a family. Just look, look around the room. God has given you a family to belong to. And we're here to help you out as well in the midst of this. And especially this particular passage, he's going to talk a lot about unity. But that's where the, the, that's where the therefore is coming from. No doctrine, because doctrine is important, and it, it, leads, it leads to prevention of, of legalism, and doctrine helps us to, to lean on the, on the truth so that we don't exhaust ourselves trying to be, be a holy person when we don't think we are. But in reality, the Bible says in Ephesians, right? It says, right now you are perfect and holy before the Father. You're standing. So Paul is not asking you to do something uh, that you're not. He's asking you to become the, the person you really are in front of God. You are that person. Live like it. Live like it. It's important. And again, Paul is not just, he, he's, he starts with, he's therefore, that's all that first chapter. And he begins, uh, I, Paul, depending on what your version, version reads, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul, when he writes Ephesians, is a prisoner in Rome awaiting execution. Waiting while trial before the before near before the the, the Caesar ultimately is going to lead to his martyrdom uh, because he's preaching the gospel and more importantly not just he's preaching the gospel but he 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 dared he dared bring the gospel message to the Gentiles the people who were not Jews uh, if you go back into Acts I think it's Acts chapter 21 uh, I said he stands he stands before the crowd the crowd's all trying to beat him up and the, the Roman guards are carrying him through the crowd and then he says let me speak to them and he starts talking to them and they're like he speaks Hebrew and they they got quiet and he tells them about all his his testimony about how God had transformed his heart how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus all this great things and all people were like mm, that's pretty good and then he goes and that's why I need to go preach Christ to the Gentiles and at that point the crowd broke it and said let's kill him all right so that's how uh, how dangerous the message was to bring Christ's love to everyone, not just his own people. And so Paul is writing to Ephesus and said, listen, all the things I'm about to tell you, I'm in prison because I'm doing them. I'm living them. And it is, and it is for your sake that I'm doing these things. Like, well, what does that matter to me now? Paul has now got martyred and dead. How does that apply to me? I'm just telling you that Paul is not asking you to do something he wasn't willing to, to put his life on the line to do because it's that important. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping in, in my own life, as, as one of your pastors here, that I reflect that same thing. All right? And so I'm just asking, I'm not asking you to do something that hopefully I'm not doing either. All right? And call me out if I am. If I, it says, like this message, when I practice a little bit in my head, it came across a little bit more meaner than I wanted to. And Paul is talking about being gentle in this passage. And I was like, and then, and another thing. And I was like, wow, that's... It's not as gentle as I need to be. So call me out. Say, gentle, gentle, please, Pastor. Gentle. So Paul is, is saying nothing for, for us in that. All right. Now he says he urges us. Uh, he could have used a stronger word. But normally how Paul writes his letters to, to the Christians that he's writing to, he tries to get them just to come along. Right? They're like, they're like listen, this is the thing we need to do. Let's do it. Let's do this together. He's, he's collaborative. Now, he, he stops being collaborative at the end of chapter 4. So if you need that kind of direction, like do this, don't do that, that's coming. But right now, he's trying to get you on board the train without having to be not gentle with you. So this is a, a, an urgent request, but it's still a requirement. So everything that we're going to talk about here is important to do. Don't just set it off to the side and say, maybe one day it will be good to have that. This, these, are, these are imperatives. And if God has said it, if it's a command by God, and Jesus really rose again from the dead, and he is God, and he is Lord, then he gets to make the rule. And that's going to be really important as we read all the rest of Ephesians. Because there are some things in there that are going to hit you in your heart pretty hard. 
because, because your, your culture, culture may not may not have a, a, is resisting, resisting those commands of God. God. I know mine is as I, I read that and I go, man, I, I'm falling short of the glory of God. And the Bible says, yes, yes, you are. And I need Jesus today. Yes, yes, I do. And guess what? You need Jesus today. You need Jesus today to, to make all this happen. All right. So we'll get, we'll get into it. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Uh, in the, I think we read out of the NIV, it says, live in a manner worthy. Uh, I use the word uh, walk uh, because he uses it several times in Ephesians. And if I just use the NIV, I'll, I'll miss some of his emphasis. Uh, in chapter 2, he talks about walking. In chapter 4, he mentions it again in verse 17. In chapter 5, in uh, 2, 8, and in 15, he mentions walking. Don't walk like those people. Walk in this way. Walk in this way. So this is a big theme of his. To, to walk. So you can look at, you can read those through those scriptures a little bit later. But walking is really important because it identifies you with the the indwelling of something that God has already done for you. I, I am tired of, of sitting down and talking to somebody and they're like, you know, I don't want to be a believer in Christ. I don't need to go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. And what they mean by that is they say one thing and they live their life like it doesn't matter. Remember, us, uh, and if you're, you're anti-smoking cigars, I don't like smoking them, but sometimes when you're deployed, like that's how you get to talk to people. Okay, so I was smoking a cigar. It's disgusting. I just, but if you're into that, and I was sitting down with a guy, and we were talking. He was talking. Some I forget what happened, but he was like, you know, uh, one he was like a deep theologian. He wasn't a believer, but he was like, you know, if God, if God gets the credit for good things, then God also gets the credit for when bad things happen. And I said, in a lot of ways, that you, that's true. Because God is sovereign over that, and he's accounted for even the bad things that have happened in your life. Uh, so I'm not going to persuade somebody if they're, they're going down that road. But then he was like, you know, I just, the reason I'm not a believer in God is because all the people that I know, I know that was, that was global and criticism and all that stuff, because everybody that I know is, is one way on Sunday morning. And he mentioned a couple of people that were pastors. He goes, this was a pastor of a church I went to, and then that night I saw him down at the strip club. And I was like, well, if you're preaching something on Sunday morning, and it obviously only has a staying power of two hours, then is it worth it at all? Or are you just a faker? And so this is, this is very important when, when Paul urges us to walk this walk. You open your mouth and say, I am a believer in Christ, and nothing in your life is in alignment with that. Then something is very wrong. Yeah, I, that's kind of from, from the outside. And I, I know in the scope of Ephesians, he's like, here, this is an in-family discussion, right? He's going to be talking about us, encouraging us, because he's assuming that you're part of the family of God. But your walk, how you, how you live your life, the things that you say, the things that you do, and the things that you think, will reflect what you believe about God, what you believe about Jesus, and what you believe about yourself. It's so vital. And that's why he's, he's like, this is going to be so important. That's why he mentions it time and time and time and time again. Because as you walk, that's what you're, that's what you're approving of. That's what you're approving of. Uh, in, a, in El Paso, I was stationed in Fort Bliss, which is a lovely assignment. If you've never been there, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, but some people, because uh, they spend too much time in the sandbox. But... If you're, you're there and had, had a good time, the, 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 one of the, the neat things about being in El Paso is the Sun Bowl is there. And they, it's one of the college football uh, things. So we went, they get, usually get some free tickets they hand out to service members. So I got a ticket. Me and my wife went. I think it was the Pac-12 plan. Who were they playing? I don't remember. I'm a Pac-12 guy, even though it's probably going to become like the Pac-2 in a couple years from now. But that's okay. Uh, it's Stanford, which I don't really like, but they were playing somebody, so I was like, I'll go see this, this Pac-12 game. And they won that game. But the important part of the story is, not that, that part, is during, you know, the songs, I, I'm a terrible dancer, okay? But you know, in the crowd, they're like, that's more basketball. But they, they, they have this music that you're playing, and I was dancing on one side of the stadium, right? And I have a particular dance, and it's just almost similar to this, and it's horrible. And I tell my, I tell my kids, like, at your wedding, I will embarrass you with my, my, my great dad dance. But I had guys in the, at the game there that were part of my unit, my soldiers that were there. And I didn't know that they were there. 
And during halftime, a group of them uh, came to my section and, and found me. And they, they were like, aha, we knew it was you. We knew it was you. They were sitting on the other side of the stadium. They're like, we knew that was you. And I was like, why? Because of the way you dance, Chappie. You're the only one who does that. <laughs> right? In, in a similar way, like you can recognize people by the way they walk and the way they do things. Just, just identity. How much more so now can, can they recognize who your God is? Who you truly worship by the way you talk and the way you do things? In Protestantism, we don't really have like a, a dress that we can, like a, a clothing thing, uh, aside from some of the priests they have, you know, the collar, and you can recognize them. Like, you know, the Jews, a lot of them wear the little yarmulke on the top. Like, they can, like, you can recognize them, different aspects. Everyone wears a cross these days, so it's hard to tell if someone's actually a Christian with that. I'm not saying that we need to develop our own unique, the, the way we dress. But, but there, there has to be something, something about the way you carry yourself and the way you talk to others that's going to matter and have a, a direct impact on whether or not you believe. So Paul is urgently, urgently asking you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling because you have been elected, you've been called, you've been adopted, you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven, you're part of his inheritance. He's given you a new heart. He's taken you out of the kingdom of darkness. I'm quoting out of Colossians now. Kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. This is Ephesians chapter 2. Now he's made you alive in Christ. If you are alive in Christ, how can you still walk like you're in darkness? How can you still walk like you're a sinner? Because he's redeemed you out of that. And he's given you his grace to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And he's going he's gonna to talk about this walking. So today it's about walking in unity. Today is about walking in unity with one another. Uh, a little bit later on, we could probably say he's, he's calling us to walk in purity. So chapter 5 is going to be a really difficult chapter for a lot of people. Chapter 5 is coming. Now, into chapter 4 is going to be hard for a lot of people too. But I'm just saying, that this walking in purity piece, and, and, and probably at the end, as we're just dealing with, with relationships, and God is calling us to also walk in a particular way. All right, so how are we supposed to walk in unity? This is, this is the, 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 the full message for today. And you're like, well, you're all halfway through. I haven't even got to my, my few points. But shoot, I, I need you to know how important it is that you have to walk, to walk and talk. Because people know. They're like, I know that guy says he's a Christian, but he doesn't live like it. Which must mean that there's nothing to the message of Jesus Christ. He talks about redemption. He talks about new life. Like, what difference does God make in my life? And they're going to look at your, the way you live your life and they're going to say, zero. I look at porn. He looks at porn. I cuss a lot. He cusses a lot. I yell at my wife. He yells at his wife. Is there any difference? Does Christ make a difference in his life at all? And the answer is no. So Paul says, let that not be the case, right? And today's a new day. So if you're already feeling like, man, I, I totally messed that up. Today's a new day. Today's a new day because with Christ, you get a new day every single time. All right, so how should we walk in unity? This, is, this section's all about uh, the inner unity, not necessarily with the outside world. I'm going to just, I'm going to mostly focus in on, on us. How do we treat each other? How does common ground treat each other? How, what should be our, our uh, what should we be known for? And that's part of our, it's going to be kind of found in our attitude, and then he does give two imperatives. But he's, he's going to start with our attitude, and I want to cover that. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's three things about our attitude. There's really two. Two are grouped together, uh, and then there's one. All right. So the first one is humility and gentleness. He says, I, I urge you to walk in that manner worthy with all humility and with all gentleness. This is with, with people um, that God is calling us to, to our attitude of unity. How can we get along when we don't come from the same place? We're not from the same family. We have different belief systems. 
right? Uh, how do we get along in Christ? If Christ is truly the unifier, if, uh, if we are saved the same way, no matter where we come from, if we have this, this one Lord, one baptism, one spirit, one church, uh, one, one heaven, one way to get, no matter who you are and where you're from, then it, it, would, be, it would be who us, right? It would, it would take, we should take a lot of work uh, to strive to love on our brothers and our sisters because there's no one here who is greater than anyone else here. And if you think you're greater, just know that Jesus says, whoever wants to be the greatest in his kingdom needs to be the least. Which is one of the, one of the things I said when I, when I took on this particular job. I said to you, I am your servant, but you are not my master. I have one master like we all do. Right? I, and I hope, I hope I'm, I'm living that. And call me out if I'm not. Preferably after the service, pull me off to the side. You don't have to say it here while I'm preaching. But that we need to be servants of one another. And that, that can be hard and difficult, depending on, on which, which society I'm in. I'm, I'm learning a little bit about Korean society. And, like, being the oldest is really nice in Korea, right? Being the eldest is, is really nice because there's a lot of honor that comes to that. I'm not saying that they're not due honor. But, when, but at the end of the day, when the doors close and we are here as a body of Christ, like, that way of, of treating other people uh, dissipates. Because we are now all equal in Christ. And you may, you may be all honor due to you in here. And someone could do something that could offend you pretty easily. Uh, and I'm not trying to pick on just the Korean culture. But I just... And you can get easily offended because that's how it's built in. But no, Christ is calling you to set aside your right for that honor. In order to love on somebody else who may have offended you, to put up with their unpleasantness. So humility is one of the, is one of the words that in, in, in Roman times, so Rome, even the Greeks, like if, you're, if you have humility, you're a terrible person. They hated it. It was on their, when they made a list of things that you didn't want to be, humility was, a, was like number one on that list. And here we are, Christ has come, and Paul says, humility is like your number one. Right? And part of that is just a realization of who you are between you and God, just the distance. The Bible says that you have fallen short of God's glory by a lot, not just by a little bit, by a lot. So much so that there's nothing that you can do to make up and, and, and get back to God in a good relationship with Him because it's that far different. In God there is no darkness, but in us there is. And darkness and light cannot go together. God knew that, so he loved on us so much that he died on the cross for us uh, to give us his light. It's not our light that we get saved by, it's by Christ's light. The light came into the world. And so when we call upon him, it's he transfers his light to us, and now we can stand in God's presence because of what God has done. It's his, Christ's light shining in me that allows me to stand before a holy God where there's no darkness. And if you have that in your mindset, you cannot, you cannot be uh, an angry person with somebody else. Because if you fully understand how much God has forgiven you, you will be humble enough when somebody irritates you with something to extend the, the, the branch of, of, of humility to them. And why would, I, why, would I, why would I talk about humility in a little bit? Because right? Christ is our full example of humility. If he, is our, if he is our God, He is our King, then we need to be like Him and do the things that He has done. If you've never read Philippians chapter 2, just 3 through 8, I encourage you to do so. Just write that down. I won't have time to read it. I want you to look at it. But it talks about that Jesus is God and the Father is God, and they are co-equal in power. Right? Jesus is not less than the Father. They are equal. But this particular passage says that Jesus did not consider equality with God the Father as something that, that he needed to hold on to. And that he humbled himself and became a human being. And he died on the cross for the sake of many. And if Jesus thought that was all the honor and glory was due to him, all the offense was sent onto God from us, but he humbled himself enough to come to the earth to die for you and for me, and he's calling for you to die to you, right? To serve other people. Like that's the humility piece 
Do you know how, how much darkness, how much evil uh, the walk you used to be in the way uh, as a, of a Gentile before you came to Christ, and now you're a new person? How much more so can you pass off that? There's that passage, I don't know if I have it in my notes here or not, but in, in Matthew, he talks about one of the servants, the king, he wanted to, I think it's in Matthew, uh, the different versions of this parable in the Gospels, but this in particular one, I think in Matthew, uh, the king wants to settle accounts with all his workers. And there's a guy who owns like 10,000 talents. So like 15 tons of gold, right? A couple of years, like last year, it would have been like, he, he owned 1,000 Bitcoin, okay? And he said, he's like, I need my money. And the servant was like, I don't have money. Please, I beg you, have pity on me. Have mercy on me. Uh, you know, with with all, all that is good, right? Here, I'm humbling myself before you have... And the king was like, you know what? I erase your debt. You no longer owe me anything. And I'd be like, yes. And that guy should have gone away thanking God that he had been forgiven all that money because he was going to... The king was like, I will throw you, your wife, and your kids into prison until you pay me all that back. And he gets that forgiven. So now his wife is safe, his kids are safe. And he's walking down the street. And he sees a guy who owes him $5 five bucks. He's like, hey, Jim, Jim, give me my five bucks. And Jim says the exact same thing as he did to that guy who, who owed like two billion dollars to the king. And Jim was like, please have mercy on me. I don't have the five bucks now. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me do something. I don't have it. Have mercy on me. And he's like, no. And he grabs him and he takes him down and he throws him in prison and his family and his kids. Now, the king hears about it is not happy. Right? That, that parable ends not in a good way for the guy who didn't, who didn't do what was right based off of what he was given. And the same, the same thing that we have here in this particular passage. Like Paul, is, Paul is talking about that humility, right? Allowing just the forgiveness of other people because if they've offended you, it doesn't matter how much more has God given you grace and mercy for the things that you've done. And now because somebody... Uh, said the wrong thing, they dress the wrong way, they irritate you, they forgot to take a bath, they smell, they, their voice is irritating, right? Then all of a sudden you're going to go above and beyond breaking unity with one another because they just annoy you some way. Yet, how often have you annoyed God? Have you, asked, you should ask yourself that question. How much do I annoy God? And yet God with his patience and loving kindness towards me extends that grace, right? That's part of this humility. So gentleness, Matthew chapter 11. Uh, gentleness is not being harsh. Um, if you're gentle, uh, in one of, the, one of the things I know that uh, a couple comes to me for therapy and they're, they're doing some stuff, how they talk to each other, how, how harsh they are towards each other with the problems they think they have, right? If somebody leaves their boots on the floor all the time, could be the wife, could be the husband, doesn't really matter. But whoever's offended the most, and they, and they say something like, you always leave your boots in there because you don't love me, and I'm tired of it. Anytime that you start with that, I will guarantee you the conversation is not going the way you want it to be, which is, oh, I'm sorry, I did it again. I, I just I keep forgetting. I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. That's not what I mean, because I love you a lot. Prove it! Right? It's like this harshness that comes back. And you're like, Gentleness is the, is, the only, is the only answer to a harsh startup, right? Gentleness is you know, like, hey, yesterday you left your boots on the floor. That hurt me. And I'm a little sad. That's a gentle startup, right? And the, and the person on the other side of the couch uh, should, if they have any kind of empathy whatsoever, be like, oh, I didn't know I hurt you that bad. Like, that's, that's not what I want to do. I really need to, I need, we need to get better. Right? There's, a, there's a way different conversation. Gentleness is really important. So if somebody has offended you in here, I don't care what it is, somebody has offended you in here, how you go about saying that you've offended me uh, matters. The words that you use, the language that you use in, in, in coming to them and requesting some kind of, of reconciliation, how you go about trying to get that matters. And it better be with humility and, ju and gentleness. That's an attitude that, that we need to have coming to do that. The second one is, is patience. He lists patience. He says humility, uh, gentleness, and then patience. That's just long-suffering. 
right? Maybe that's a better word than just patience. Long suffering, right? If somebody's offending you over and over again, it's going to be difficult. You just have to bear with it. Bear with the unpleasantness of other people. You just have to bear with the unpleasantness of other people. Why? Because you're unpleasant often times to somebody else and you want them to give that to you. That's part of what in Philippians he's entreating like these two ladies are fighting. He's just like, just put up with each other with gentleness. Like, get along. And that goes into the commands that we have that, that Paul has. I know I'm kind of running out of time here, so I guess quickly the imperatives. Finding at the end of verse 2, um, he says, bearing with one another in love. So he says, what does is, what is long-suffering look like? That, that's our attitude. What does that look like? It looks like this at the end of chapter, uh, end of verse 2. Bearing with one another in love. That's an imperative. You have to do it. It's an imperative. You have to do it. And then verse 3, it says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So those are the two imperatives. Uh, in, uh, eager to maintain the unity and... Uh, to bearing with one another in love. And that word, that word eager, it, it has a different connotation. It's, a, it's not just a nice thing, but there's an urgency to it. You must do it with all your whole being. Do it. Don't wait right now. Today's the day. Today's the hour. Today's the minute. Today's the second. Do it. Do it. Don't wait. Maintain the unity. Now, you don't, you, don't, you don't develop the unity that comes from the Spirit. It's already present. The things that are invisible, the things that God has granted us through His Spirit, those, those doctrines that we've talked about, those are present in your life. They're present in the family of God together. And now you have to make those visible. If God has reconciled you to Himself, then you need to reconcile with those whom He's also reconciled to. So I don't know who you are in here. But if there's somebody that's offended somebody else in this room, I, I need, before the service ends, I need you to make amends to God, and then after the service you need to find them, and you need to make amends with them. For the sake of the unity of peace, because this is an imperative, this is not just something that you, that you should have. This is an imperative. If another, body, another believer, I don't, it, out, on the outside, but they're a Christian, and they've offended you in some way, you know they're a believer in Christ, they may not live exactly like you, but they're not doctrinally unsound, okay? They're not doing weird stuff. You need to go, under the, with that, you need to go and make amends with them, because this is the, an imperative. It's so much so, he uses that word like, I, I urge you, and there's just no good English word that gives you this, do it now, don't wait, it's an emergency. Because if you don't, bad things happen because you're not walking in a manner worthy of the calling that God has, God has given you. And you're like, well, I don't know what that all exactly means. Well, just you read, read Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, and it will give you a little bit better understanding of insight maybe into what Paul is talking about here. Because he does talk about, may God, uh, Matthew 18 is the, the parable of the, the king. That forgives. Uh, but in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, he says, Forgive as God has forgiven you. Reconcile as God has reconciled with you. Don't wait. So those are our, those are our imperatives. I, I'm not saying that for the sake of, of peace you let everything go, because obviously that's not true. There are parts of the, the scripture where, where Paul is like, That person, don't even eat with them, because they are continually not walking in a manner worthy of the calling. So there does come a time when you break, you break, you stop, break contact with them. So I'm not talking about like deep sin. You know, somebody, somebody's doing some weird stuff with somebody else. Like you step in and you do something about that. I'm talking about little offenses arise to that level. You do what you must to forgive them. How many times did Jesus say you must forgive your brother? Seven times. 70, that's 490 times a day. That's one time every three minutes if you're doing the math. And I don't think Jesus was actually just saying that's the limit. So if you're like, I forgive you, forgive you, forgive you, forgive you, forgive you, forgive you, forgive you. hit 491, you're like, yes, justice time. Right? That's not, that's not the intent. So forgive one another. It comes with those attitudes that I have.
Okay, yeah, no, I need to be done. Right. So, so our attitudes that we need to have for this particular passage, passage humility, gentleness with patience, long suffering with people, but we have to bear one another. We just have to do it. We're from different different places of the world, different families that we grew up in, or or a multi denominational being. We're not non denominational in here. There's a bunch of people that have all sorts of things. Uh, but, but for the sake of Jesus Christ and his gospel, we are here together. We, hold, we do hold traditional values all together, but we're multi-denominational. That we need to bear with one another, uh, even if I, I'm offensive to you. So I'm thankful that, that there are many of you in here that would like to see me in a suit and tie, but you haven't required me to do that. And I appreciate that. With gentleness, you have, you, you have talked to me. And I appreciate that. All right? So little things. Bear with me. But let's be eager. Let's be eager to attain unity. And let's repent if you need to repent. Connect if you need to connect. Don't wait. Don't wait. Today. Jesus said if you have offended your brother uh, and you're at the altar and you remember that, to leave it and go make amends before you come back and start talking to him. So I, I urge you today, if you've offended somebody or someone you've taken offense at somebody, I ask you to lay it at the foot of the cross because Christ has reconciled that even unto himself through his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's pray. Here's the Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Um, God, if I, if I have offended you, may I, may I stop what I'm doing right now and make a connection to you. God, if I have offended anyone in here, let me know so I can go and I can make amends. These are imperatives. God, may we all have a spirit of humility, dealing with one another, in particular the people here inside the, 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 your church, inside your family, because we're dealing with other believers. The people that, that do your will are my brothers and sisters, and so, Father, I pray that you would allow, allow us to love one another in unity, with long-suffering, because you have loved us first. And while we were your enemy, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we could be reconciled. So let us be about your business, Father, reconciling each other because we are in Christ. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen.